We're in the middle of a series called Far More, and we kicked it off a few weeks ago. This whole idea that you and I, we, we want to get far more out of our lives in 2019, 2018. Far more out of relationships, far more out of finances, far more out of our health, far more out of our purpose. We want far more joy, hope, peace, love. I want those things for you, and I, and I want those things for myself. I came to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. And so what does it look like as, as we follow Jesus to experience far more out of life? But today, I'm, I'm going to shift gears just a minute, and I want to talk about far less. I want far less for you and, and far less for me in 2019 than we experienced in 2018. Because I'm confident that if we will experience far less of this, what will happen is then we will get far more out of areas of our life. If we can experience far less of this topic that we're going to talk about over the next few minutes than the, every other area of our life, relationships and finances and work and school, we will experience far less. And so the thing I want you to experience far less of in 2019, and I want myself to experience far less of, is the topic worry and anxiety. And you might use those words interchangeably, worry and anxiety far less anxiety in 2019 than you had in 2018. And I think inherently, I think inherently we know we shouldn't worry, but we do it anyway. And Jesus was teaching in Luke chapter 12, verse 25, he's teaching a rhetorical question as he's teaching about money and possessions and worry. He says this, he goes, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And the people listening and you and I would go like, well, no, I I imagine Jesus paused for dramatic effect. And then he said this, he goes, and if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, then what's the use of worrying over bigger things? If worry can't add a single moment to life, if worry doesn't add anything, then why in the world do we do it? And maybe you just need to know this just for your own good, that the worry will add absolutely nothing to your life. Worry will add absolutely and I don't think anybody in there disagrees. I don't think you go, well, the more I worry, the more joy I have, Chris. The more anxiety, I just fits peace comes with it. No, it, it adds absolutely nothing, but we still do it anyway. I still do it anyway, and so do you. It's the question, well, why would you do something that adds nothing? If worry really doesn't add anything to your life, then why in the world would you and I do something that adds nothing? And I'll tell you, personally speaking, and I think it's probably true for most people in here, but for me, worry gives me a false sense of control. It gives me a false sense of control. The situation out of my control, I think I've can. The more I worry, the more anxious, you know, you get the tight chest, the racing thoughts. The more worry I have about this, then maybe I can control it. And the problem is, if you buy into that lie long enough, not only does it sense of control, worry and anxiety then begin to control you. They begin to control your relationships and your sleep pattern, your thought life, and the tightness in your chest. So why in the world would we do nothing? Why do we worry? Because it gives us a false sense of control, and we've bought into the lie that, that maybe this time it will be different. Maybe this time it will change. Now, I'll tell you something that I do. I don't know about you, but I... I tried to trick my trash men into taking things that they shouldn't. <laughs> okay? Yeah, so there's one here. Okay, the rest of you model citizens. I, I put him in a black trash bag. Do you do that trick? <laughs> on the bottom, the trash bag's on top. Of, like, I put things in there like bricks, concrete, <laughs> lumber, you know, stuff that they, you know. And every single time, I don't know if my trash men are like Sherlock Holmes, but they, they get it. And they, they pull up. Oh, Chris tried it again. And they, they literally take it out and just leave the stuff there. Now, we have this game. I think it's a game. I just leave it there to see how long it will take. And eventually, after four weeks, they weaken the stuff. But there, when they don't take it, I walk out. I'm not surprised. I knew I didn't get away with it again. But still, the next week, when I have bricks or concrete or lumber, I'll wheel my little trash can down there. I'll then I'll strategically place the trash bags on top of that, thinking this time it'll be different. This time it will change. And worry is the exact same way. We know it won't change. 
We know it doesn't add anything, but we go, well, maybe and it gives us a false sense of control. So what do you do when worry and anxiety knock on the door of your life? When they're knocking on the door of your life and, on, and, and of your heart, going, come in, what do you do there when it's knocking and it's going, hey, let us in, we'll help, we'll help you control the situation. What do you do when worry and anxiety knock on the door of your life? If you've got a Bible, grab it. I need you to chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at part of this letter written by Paul, and he talks about worry and how to deal with it and, and anxiety. Now, what's interesting is he's writing this letter, uh, he's a prisoner against his will, and he's writing on worry. So Paul's not writing this from Club Med. Right? He's not on the golf course going, hey, I've got some ideas. He's not like in a mountainous retreat writing this letter. He's writing it as a prisoner held against his will. He talks about worry. Now, if anybody would have any excuse to worry, to allow anxiety in life, it'd be Paul. he go study the life of Paul. It didn't go well for him. I mean, he was beaten and shipwrecked and, and stoned multiple inches of his death. He was whipped. He was imprisoned against his will. It did not go well. But Paul writes about worry and how to combat it. Look at uh, Philippians 4, verse 6. Worry about anything. And I think it's, and he didn't say, don't worry about the small things. Don't worry about the little bitty things. He didn't say, you guys can worry about the really major things. He goes, don't worry about He said, instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Well, you almost get this tone of a man who really doesn't have worry in his life, doesn't have anxiety in his heart. The peace of God feels like. And he continues on. Verse 8, he goes, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learn and receive from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. What do you do the, the next time that worry begins to, to knock on the door of your life? And, and it will. It'll knock on the door of your life, and it'll say, hey, come, can we come hang out? I got my buddy anxiety with me. And you go, no, not today. And they're like, come in. No, today's not a good day. No, today's a great day to allow us into your life and your heart. We promise things will go better. And there, when they're knocking on the door, what do you do? I would simply just want you to remember these three letters. P-T-A. Pray, think, act. And well, Chris, that's a rather simple sermon. <laughs> You're welcome. That's why you come here. <laughs> because here's what I know. Here's what I know. And in all seriousness, when worry is it's knocking you're not going to go back and go, no, what were those 11 points in the original Greek language that Chris talked about last Sunday? You just want three, three letters, pray, think, act, pray, think, act. When worry, when anxiety, when you see the, the racing thoughts beginning to kick up, when you feel the tightness in your chest beginning, when you feel the shortness of breath, there when it begins to knock on the door of your heart and of your mind, pray, think, act. Let's go back and look at it. I want you to look at verse six, where he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And that word pray, earnestly, or to pray with passion. It's not just a simple toss up a prayer, but it's to pray with earnest in your prayers, to pray with passion in your prayers. So my question for you is, does your passion does it match the passion in your emotions? Does the passion in your prayer match the passion in your emotions? And he goes, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Not either or, but both and. Both tell him what you need, least the worry and anxiety. Go, God, this is what I need. I need this job. I need this illness to go away. I need this relationship to be restored. I need this to work out. I need this door to open. I need this door to go. God, this is what I need. And I think we pray with passion in that. 
But then he goes, on the flip side, thank him for what he has done. And we thank him for what he's done because it reminds us of going, oh, he's taken care of me in the past, and so I trust he'll take care of me in the future. But all too often when it comes to going, oh, yeah, God, I appreciate that. It's not either or, it's both in. Does your prayers in your life, do they match the passion in your emotions? God, God did not create a bunch of robots. He created emotional We experience joy and love and excitement and thrill and laughter and happiness. And we also experience sadness and heartbreak and disappointment and frustration. And do they match the emotions that you're feeling? I I think we go, God, this is what I need. God, I'm hurting. God, I'm struggling. But when he answers, when he delivers, when there is joy, when there is peace, do you thank him for it? This. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for taking care of me. God, thank you for this peace. Thank you for this relationship working out. When it comes to worry in your life, prayer is the very first thing, and it should be a prayer of passion, prayer of earnestness, and in your mind. I'll tell you something I do. Now, with the trash can story, now this story, I do feel like this is confession time for Chris, so I hope you're enjoying this. But um, I'll tell you one thing that I do on a weekly, probably daily basis drive, I verbally talk to the other drivers on the road. <laughs> do you do that? Amen. Yeah. Just by a show of hands. Can I? Oh, good. Oh, whoa. Wow. All right. Next time we see each other, we should have like on the road. I talk to him on the road. I'm both good and bad, good and bad, but I ask him questions. Why did you cut me off? Do you realize the pedal on the right is the accelerator on the left is a brake? Are you ever going to turn left or is that just a with the whole time. (laughs) Do you understand what the left lane is for and what the right lane is for? Did you go to driver's ed? I have these conversations. I'm a curious person by nature, okay? But now on on the flip side, a very grateful driver. Very grateful driver. Like after church, uh, when you let me out onto Highway 9 heading north, I'm very grateful for that. I thank you. I tell you, you're awesome. Like you are so awesome. And I wave and I think the more grateful that I am. And Brianna's like, I think they get, I was like, no, I just want them to know how much they mean to me in this moment. And then like, you know, a minute or two later, I'll wave again just so they know, man, I'm, I'm for you. I'm, I'm a fan of your conversation, passionate conversation with them, as I think most of you do as well. But when it comes to our, our walk and our talk with God, our prayer life with God, does the passion in our prayer, does it match that emotion that we're feeling? God, I'm worried. God, I'm so God, the raising thoughts are beginning. God, the tightness in the chest is beginning. God, the, the shortness of breath is happening. God, help. And then also the gratitude. God, thank you. Thank you for delivering. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being gracious. Thank you for, thank you for giving me the influence. God, thank you. Does the passion of your prayers match the passion of your emotions? When word and anxiety begin to knock on the door of your life, first thing is to pray and pray with passion. Second thing is to thank to verse eight, verse eight, think. He says, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. He says, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So it goes from your prayer life now then to your thought life. And when that thought of worry or anxiety hits, he gives you a list of what to through. Is it true? Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it lovely? Is it pure? That when, when you allow the thoughts, you run it through this filter. You don't just allow any thought in there and going, well, you know, this is, this is what it should be. He goes, no, just your thoughts, run it through a filter. Now, you've got the, the coffee filter that we're hand. If you've got it, kind of hold it up so I see it. Okay. Hold it up. And here's what I want you to do with it. I need you to flatten it out and I need you to grab a pin and let the person before you stole it, I mean, borrowed it. Um, it's marketing. Anyway, all right. And I need you to write down some things. I want you to write down this list and put it on this coffee filter. A couple of reasons why. Number one, when was the last time you filter when you came to church and told a ride on it? So you, you'll remember that. Second thing is I want you to put this filter somewhere close to you. Nightstand in your wallet, in your glove box, somewhere where you will see it to begin to filter your thoughts through it the really big reason behind it. But I want you to go to verse eight. 
And I just want to go through the list, give you some questions to write down. Now, I was told in the first service, Chris, you went way too fast through the questions, to which my response is, write faster. So anyway, so my wife didn't appreciate that response, but whatever. Um, First one is this, true, true. Is this a true thought? Is this a true thought? Now, for some probably eliminate half the worry in your life. Because half the worry in your life, it's not true. But we allow it in there anyway. Is it a true thought? No, but you know, it just feels like something I should allow in there. If it's not true, filter it out. Second one is this, honorable, honorable. Is this thought worth my mental capacity? Is this thought worth my mental capacity? Your brain and my brain only has so much capacity. Our most Capacity, is this thought worth it? Right, right. Is this a God honoring thought? Is this a God honoring thought? Pure. Is this a morally clean thought? Oh, there she is. Y'all can all talk to her afterwards and go, You were right, Brianna. Listen, <laughs> we got to have a talk, all right? It's a real talk right here. I'm going to put the whole list for you up at the end of the service, all right? So just, just relax, all right? I tell you what, uh, get ready up there, Brian up there in the booth. I'm, we're going to make this 11 o'clock service memorable, all right? I mean, what word are we on? Pure. Okay, cool. I'm not thinking a pure thought right now about all of y'all. Y'all are irritating me. <laughs> Lovely. Is this a kind, winsome, or gracious thought? No, it's not, Lord. I'm getting convicted right now. Lovely. Is this a kind, winsome, or gracious thought? Admirable. Is this a junkie or thought? And then the last one, excellent and praiseworthy. Does this thought lean toward optimism or pessimism? Now, Brian, up in the back, go ahead and put the big list up there for me. Let's go ahead and spoil this crowd rotten. There they are right there. Yeah. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah, y'all are special. All right. Um, take your picture, pull out your phones. There it is right there. But here's the list. And here's why I wanted you to write it on a coffee filter. Oh, blame him up there in the booth. Hey. There. You got this little thing, little thing on your phone called a camera. I'd probably take a picture of it and then you can put it on the filter afterwards. All right. So while you're writing that down, let me tell you why. Keep it up there for just a second. We want to make everybody happy, Brian. Well, I'm going to use the restroom. Are you all doing that? All right. So I'm going to, are you all, are you all pretty well done? Some, yeah. Uh, thanks. All right. Uh, we'll put it up at the end. All right. Put it, take it down, Brian. So here's why, here's why the coffee filter and, and not a piece of paper, the coffee filter and this air filter are both in my house. Now I change my coffee filter out every single day. I change my air filter out, uh, <laughs> Less than I'm supposed to. I don't know. Once a year? No, I do more than that. <laughs> I did it last night because I was preaching on it and I was reminded to. So, you know, I don't want to change it every three months, six months. The, the point is this. The filter on your mind should be changed out every single day, not every three months or six months or once a year. It should be one of those deals where every morning you wake up going, Lord, let my thoughts be right and true and pure and clean and honorable and God-honoring. I don't want to go another day with a dirty filter on my mind and my thoughts. So every morning, Lord, I'm starting over and fresh. Now, if you've ever had a coffee filter that failed, right, and the coffee grounds go in, do you know where I'm going with this? And you pour that hot cup of coffee in the morning, and you take that sip, and you get a mouthful of grounds. It ruins your day. No, it ruins your week. It's that moment where you go, oh, oh, it's awful, the filter the bad stuff to go through, the, the same way should be around your thought life. If that filter fails and you allow an untrue thought, an ungodly thought, and, and not a winsome, not a gracious thought, not, not, a, not an optimistic thought, if you allow those things in your life, you should go, oh my goodness. Change the filter going, Lord, this worry, this thought, this anxiety, this should be filtered out. Knock on the door of your life. Pray. Pray with passion. Pray with earnest. Think. Think filtered thoughts. 
Think the right thoughts, the filter thoughts on a daily basis. And then the last one is A, is act. Act. Look at verse 9. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Into practice. And what he's saying is, it's not a single act. It, it means repeatedly or habitually. It means to make a habit out of the right things. Act with the right habits in your life and in your mind and in your heart. One time deal. It's not like where you show up to church and get a 30 minute sermon and a coffee filter and go, oh, worry's fixed. And I've, I've got it nailed down. I've got, I got my coffee filter. Worry this afternoon, tomorrow, the next day, the day after. It will continue to knock on the door of your life. It will bring its buddy anxiety with it and go, hey, let us in. Let us hang out. It's going to be better. And it's not going to be fixed by a 30 minute sermon. It's going to be fixed over the right habits over time. Time that you'll never get to this point of following Jesus where you go, I've got it. There will always be one step more that you can grow closer and closer to Jesus. It is a lifelong journey of following Jesus. Over anxiety is a lifelong of making the right habits every single day and saying, God, let me, let me have compassion. Let me have forgiveness. God, let me have self-control. God, let me swallow my pride and continue to see that counselor. God, let me things over time. And you know this, but when it comes to sports, music, art, speaking, writing, whatever industry that you're in, people that make those things look easy, when they make those things look easy, it means they spend hours behind the scenes that no one saw in order to make everybody else think that what they see looks easy. They spend hours and hours in practice and in self-control and doing the right things behind the scenes that nobody sees. You, you see this every four years with the Olympics. Right? You see these athletes and they compete and you're going, oh my goodness, they're amazing. But nobody sees the four years of training. When, when you see somebody play the piano or musical instrument or, or write, you're going, oh my goodness, you're so gifted. Nobody sees the practice behind the scenes. When you see a godly marriage, when you see a person of faith, nobody and on their knees and praying and searching the scripture and in those moments that nobody knows but between them and God. You want a life full of faith that all can see? It starts in the place that nobody sees. It starts with the godly habits, day in and day out, week in and week out. Then all of a sudden someone goes, my goodness, your, your marriage, your kids, your finances, your faith, it's, I, I can't believe, how did you do that? And you're going, it's not a one-time sermon. It wasn't a song. It was a lifetime of right, godly habits, day in and day out. When it comes to doing the right things, do the right things every time, over time, and all of a sudden worry and anxiety become a distant memory. But what happens is you go to a men's retreat, a women's retreat, a summer camp, and you get all excited, and you're following God for a month strong, and then it doesn't work out. And then it gets painful. Then it's just not as glamorous. And all of a sudden, you stop following God the way you once did. And you're going, what happened? My life is a mess. The worry and anxiety. I mean, I'm all the time. What happened to my marriage? What happened to my finances? What happened in my life? What happened is that you stop following God and doing the right things day after day after day. Yeah, you trust him. Yeah, your salvation's intact, but you live in your own life. You remember the story of the prodigal son? He never stopped being the, the son of the father, but he went away. And so, so for many of you, you've, you've done the God thing for a while, and it didn't really work out the way you wanted it to. You kind of checked out. And I'm here to tell you to continue to do the right things, the godly habits every time over time. You want a life of great faith that's not built off of one week. You want a faith is not built off of one conference. It's built off the daily habits. And so growing up, my parents wanted the three kids to be well-rounded. So I did the sports and stuff and did science. My mom put me in piano lessons. For three years, I took piano lessons. Every week, went to the same teacher, did learn the scales and everything for three years. And at the end of the three years, I got bored with it. And I had not practiced since that 
the end of three years, but after all of those times and all of those things that I learned, after 30 plus years of of not practicing, uh, I remember one song. And I thought, my parents have spent all that money on lessons, you should receive the benefit of that one song on this piano. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, it's really not even a song, it's like five notes song when I play it. So this is, this is the only song, three years of piano lessons, and this is what happens when you do something for three years and then you stop. All the things that you learn, all the things that you practice become a distant memory because there is no practice, but there is this one song that I remember. That's it. That's all I know. Thank you very much. You know who hates that? Sean Walden. <laughs> I, I think for many of us, this is the Christian life. I know I should go to church. I know I should read my Bible, but I don't. I wonder why things aren't going well. You, you, you follow God for years. You go to the retreats. You go to the camp. And you go to the marriage conference. Maybe even go to counselor for a little bit. And all of a sudden it gets difficult. It gets boring. It's not fun anymore. It's not exciting anymore. All of a sudden you wonder why things aren't going well. You wonder why this is all you know. The reason why is you don't practice. But for the people that do practice, people that do learn and do understand, in fact, I got my buddy Dylan. Dylan has been practicing, yeah. Dylan has been practicing piano for like the last 14 years, week in and week out. And uh, Dylan can play a little bit more of that song than I can. The right habits, practice over time, makes a massive difference. It's the same when you're with your walk with God. Same when back in word he is praying with passion. It's thinking through filtered thoughts. And it's acting the right way, with the right habits every time over time. And little by little, all of a sudden, next time somebody begins to knock on the door of your life, Next time they keep on saying, let us come in, let us come in, you're going, Lord, I'm praying with passion. Lord, I need this. Lord, thank you for what you've done. Lord, help me filter my thoughts through the right things. And Lord, let me do the right things the right way every time. The truth is you cannot keep worry and anxiety from knocking on the door of your life, but you can keep it from walking in, making itself at home, getting comfortable on the couch of your heart. P-T-A, pray, act. I'll finish with this and... It's what the psalmist David writes in Psalm 139. It's what he writes, and it ties in beautifully to this. Verse 23, he says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Know me, O God, and know my heart. God, this is my prayer life. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, let my anxious thoughts be filtered out. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. The bad habits in my life, let me follow you along the right path of life. Can all your worries at a single moment to your life? No. Does that mean worry doesn't still knock on the door of your life? It will and will continue. But you pray with passion. You filter your thoughts and you act according to God's word. And then you experience that peace that passes all understanding that God's and minds as you rest in Christ Jesus. Let me pray for us. 
with every head bowed and every eye closed, for those of you in this room that you are a Christian, you know you trusted Jesus, you may have walked away, stopped practicing the right things. And maybe today you say, today, Jesus, remove the bad habits and still the right habits. Let me follow you. Maybe your marriage was great after that conversation a couple of years ago, but man, it is rocky. It's the wrong habits you've allowed in. Maybe it's how you act at work, how you act at school, how you treat others. But you're just saying, Lord, for far too long, things in my life. And so today, Jesus, I'm praying passionately, filtering out the right thoughts, filtering out the bad thoughts, filtering in the right ones, and acting according to your word. And when they're praying, for those in this room or you're watching online, you're in the you need to understand that scripture says, perfect love cast out all fear. That perfect love can only be realized in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that love was demonstrated on that cross 2,000 years ago. He died for your sins, buried, came back to life. And the truth is, if you'd place your faith in Jesus Christ, you not only receive that peace, but you receive hope and joy and salvation for the rest of your life. If you've never trusted, you can do that right here, right now. Say something like this. Mean it from the depths of your heart. Just say, today, Jesus, I trust you. I place my faith in you for the forgiveness of my sins. Fill me with your spirit and help me to live for you for the rest of my life. Thank you for my salvation. Father, I pray for all of us. Lord, as an individual, man, that understands firsthand what it feels like when we knock on the door of your life. Lord, my prayer is that all of us would pray with passion, both needs and gratitude, that we'd filter out the wrong thoughts, God, and allow the right ones to come into our life, the true, the honest thoughts. And God, my prayer is that we would walk in obedience day by day for the rest of our life, that we would continue to act with godly habits in our life. We love you, Jesus, for who you are, and we ask these things in your name. Amen.